morning from the subject of imitating God at home. I have been given some serious thought to this whole ideal of what it means to be an original. Many of us like to think of ourselves as originals. Everybody wants to be an original. No one wants to be a cheap imitation. We all want to be originals. But after thinking about that this past week, I have concluded that there are no true originals. We are all unique, but none of us are original. Now walk with me for a while. Think about this. When we think about our physical bodies, our physical makeups, are we originals? No, I would dare to say to each and every one of us, we carry the genetic code that was programmed into our parents' genetic code, and so we are derivatives of our parents, not truly originals. We are unique, but not truly original. When you consider our personalities and our character, much which was formed before we even knew who we were or where we were. Because of the, the environment, because our family orientation, because of our parents, our adults, our siblings, and others who talked to us and shaped our belief systems, we are unique, but we're not original. And so when I look at this text in Ephesians chapter 5, I believe that's what the Paul, Apostle Paul is trying to tell us. We spend so much time trying to be original that God wants us to recognize we are unique, but he wants us to realize that we are his children. Therefore, he wants to shape our character and that we should possess the spiritual genetic code of our father. And therefore, having been shaped by what we see him do, we imitate him. We exercise our own choices in our own will as we are led by him, but God wants us to imitate him. And as we imitate him, we find our uniqueness. We find our special place in his family, but we are satisfied with being imitators of him because there is no higher thing that we could ascribe to or hope for than to be like God. So very often we're so bent, bound, and determined on being original, that we fail to realize that only God is an original. Only God is an original. And God wants us to be imitators of him, but we will find our own unique walk, our own unique role as we imitate God. Are you following me so far? So we've looked at this text, and we think the big idea of Ephesians chapter 5 is how to imitate God. And Paul shows us how we imitate God. We imitate God by walking in love. As Christ walked in love, we sacrifice, we live a clean life, we have a clean mouth, a thankful life, a discerning life. We walk in the light, verses 8 through 14, a fruitful life, a pleasing life, a revealing life, an alert life. We walk in wisdom, verses 15 through 21, maximizing the moment, redeeming the time because the days are evil, understanding God's will, sober thinking, spirit filled, worshiping joyfully, always thankful submitting respectfully. And then he shows us and tells us, here's how we can imitate God. We can imitate God, verse 18 of chapter 5, when we're filled with the Spirit. When we're filled with the Spirit, now we're filled with the very life of God, and so now just as a wind fills a sail, and just as a wind bears a sailboat along in the water, when we're filled with the Spirit, God fills our life, and God can bear us along over the course of life. And so then Paul gets specific with it. He says, here is how it works its way out. Here is how it flushes itself out at home, in interpersonal relationship. Here is how a wife can imitate God. She can imitate God by submitting to her husband's leadership, by recognizing the source of his headship, by respecting his personship. I know there's not a word, but I thought it sounded good. <laughs> by respecting his personship. That's a little bit of editorial liberty that I'm exercising during that you don't have back there. How can a husband imitate God? By loving her sacrificially, with a love that sanctifies, with a love that purifies, with a love that is selfless. 
and with a love that seals the bond and the relationship. And so then Paul moves on down one more step. He says, here's how children can imitate God at home. How does that happen? Well, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. How can children imitate God at home? Children can imitate God at home by, first of all, with actions of obedience. With actions of obedience. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, the word that Paul uses for obey is not the same word that he uses for submit. In the text, a wife is never told to obey her husband. She's told to submit. It's a different word. The word submit is the word hupotasso. It carries the idea of being in the military. And so one submits to the person that's over them in rank, that has been placed in that position of authority over them in rank. And so a soldier submits to the general. He submits to his headship. He recognizes his leadership. But the word there that is used for obey in Ephesians 6.1 is hupokuo. And what it means, it comes from the Greek word, kuo means to hear. Hupo, the prefix, it means to be under. And so hupokuo means to hear under. And so what in essence it means is children, give your parents your ear. It says, give them your ear, listen to what they say, and get under what they say. Get under what your parents say. Get under their words. Children, obey your parents' words because it's right. Children, he says, hear under your parents. The primary responsibility that children have in the Bible is to obey their parents. The primary responsibility they have before God is to hear their parents' words and to obey their parents. Are you following me? A child can imitate God at home by getting under their parents' words, by hearing what their parents are saying, and by doing what their parents tell them to do. That's the primary responsibility that a child has in the Bible. Now the parent has the weightier responsibility to hear from God so that the words the parents are saying to their children are words that's coming from God, so when the children hears and obeys the word of the parent, they are hearing and obeying the word of God. Now someone is thinking, what about if I don't have a Christian parent? What if I have a parent who don't love the Bible, who don't love Jesus, who doesn't listen to God, or who isn't hearing from God? I'm glad you asked that question, because that's a good question. An inquiring mind wants to know, what does a child do when they're not in a Christian home? Now listen to this. Let's say that your parents smoke cigarettes, and your parents tell you, I don't want you to smoke cigarettes. Now, your parents may not be setting a good example for you, but your parents are giving you the right instruction. And so since they've given you the right instruction, you are duty-bound by God's word to hear what they say and to obey their word. You're required by God to disregard their example and to obey their word because their example is inconsistent with God's word, and what they're saying is in line with God's word. Are you following me? If your parents drink alcohol, smoke weed, sell crack, but if they tell you don't drink alcohol, don't smoke marijuana, then you're supposed to hear what they say and obey what they say because their words are lined up with God's word. And so anytime a parent tells a child to do something that is not in violation of God's word, that child is duty bound before God to hear what the parent says and to obey what the parent tells them to do. Children, obey. Children, get under your parents' words and hear what they have to say and do what they tell you to do. Now I want to share something. Every now and then I share a little bit about my own childhood. And so my sister's here this morning. She can testify to that. You know, my mother, God bless her. God bless her soul and my grandmother. But they had their own set of vices. And like many people in rural communities who have been oppressed by a society where there are so few opportunities for female and who have been mistreated by women, the pressure of life and the cares of life drove them to drinking. And they had serious drinking problems. And they seriously abused alcohol. 
But my mother would say to us, I bet not catch you drinking not even one drop. And alcohol was always around our house and was always accessible. But my mother said, I bet not catch you drinking alcohol. Smoke cigarettes, but I bet not catch a cigarette on your lips. Now, her example wasn't always what it should have been, but her words were always in my best interest. What she said to me was always in my best interest. What she said to my sisters was always in their best interest. And since her words were always in our best interest, she, she, her words were always ringing inside of our ears because we could see the devastation that her actions had brought to her own life and we knew what she was telling us was right. And we knew that it was true. And so since we heard her words and got under her words because we feared her rod and we feared even more her left hook, Oh, yeah, my mother would get you with a left hook. She'd get you with a left, catch you when you weren't watching with a left hook and would put you on the floor. And so our respect for her words and our belief that she and my grandmother always had our best interest at heart, so we never had to stop drinking because we never started. And we never had to stop smoking cigarettes because we never started. And we never had to stop carrying guns and knives because we never started. Because by the grace of God, even with all of her faults and my grandmother's faults and with all of our own faults, there were things that they said that we knew were right and we hear their words and we got under their words and we obeyed their words. I shared with you before, my mother would say, I bet not have to come to school to check on you, son. I ain't got time to be going to school fooling with you because you're practicing a fool. And so her expectation was, you better not bring home a failing grade, and if you get, get a failing grade, then you better not stay away. You, bet, you can't come home, but you better not stay away. <laughs> so the expectation was is that when you went to school, it wasn't for a fashion show, it wasn't for a style show, it wasn't for socialization, it was for academic excellence. We got under her word and we, had, we, we heard what she had to say, and we felt obligated to obey her word because we knew that if we didn't, there were going to be some serious consequences. And so we, because we simply obeyed what God said to her, to us, we were able to avoid some of the pitfalls of life. Are you following? And so when kids understand, most parents, most parents want the best for their children. And most parents, though they may not be setting the right example, though they may not be making the necessary sacrifices, but most parents are saying the right things. Now, the words do not have the potency and the power and the effectiveness when they're not backed up by an example. But children who are under the word of God and who hear these words from Ephesians chapter 1, now you and now, you got no excuse now. Before you heard these words, you may have had an excuse. I didn't know I was supposed to obey my parents as long as they were not violating God's word. But now you've heard it, and so you're bound to obey. Now, what if your parents tell you to do something that's wrong, something that is illegal, and something that violates what you believe to be right? You're not obligated to obey. If your parents tell you to smoke a cigarette, you're not obligated to do it. If they tell you to drink alcohol, you're not obligated to do it. If they tell you to compromise yourself in some sexual situation, you're not obligated to do it. God is obligated to provide you with some protection or some relief from that situation. But you're not obligated to disobey God at any point, even when it's a parent or an adult figure telling you that. Are you following? Because very often young children, young children and even teenagers, can be manipulated by adults in positions of authority because we tell them to obey people that are in a positions of authority, but we don't instruct them and we don't uh, inform them that you're not supposed to obey and you're not supposed to follow the direction of someone who's trying to exploit you, take advantage of you, or in some way seduce you into doing something that is wrong or something that is illegal. Children can imitate God through actions of obedience to their parents. You say, well, how do you do that? Well, when you imitate God by obeying your parents, you're imitating the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you know that Jesus Christ had to learn obedience? We had to learn obedience. Well, when he became the son of God in human flesh, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered, the writer of Hebrews said. 
And so as Jesus was submitting to God's will, it was God's will that he become the perfect sacrifice. And so he was wounded, he was beaten, he was mistreated, and he suffered. But in suffering, he learned the joy of obedience. And therefore, God could highly exalt him. Children, obey your parents and the Lord. Why? Because it's right. Who says it's right? God said that it's right. And so in obeying your parents, what you do is you are a living testimony to a world that is in disobedience and it is in rebellion. The world is in rebellion against God. Adults are in rebellion against authority. Many children are in rebellion against their parents. And so when a group of children come along and say, as long as my parents aren't telling me to do something that's illegal or immoral, I'm going to do what they tell me to do, you become trophies for God to put on display so that other young people can see how God will bless them if they do what God told them to do. Children, obey your parents because it's right. So children can imitate God at home by actions of obedience, but they can also imitate God at home by attitudes of honor and respect. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. And so what is God saying? What God is saying is, it's, don't be like the little boy who's whose mother told him to sit down and he would stand up and she said sit down and he would stand up and finally she put her hands on his shoulders and she pressed him down in the seat and he said, I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. Don't be standing up on the inside with a rebellious attitude, but have an attitude of honor, an attitude of respect. He says that obedience is the action, honor and respect is the attitude. And so when you show honor and you show respect for your parents, you're imitating God and you're imitating Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ says, I always do the thing to please my father. He always honored his father. He always respected his father. The action of obedience, the attitude of honor, and respect. And many of you children, young people, you don't understand that the greatest honor that you can show toward your parents is to live a godly life. It's to live a godly life. It's to live for the Lord and to grow to be a young person that loves the Lord and who serves the Lord and to go up and, and to, to reach your full spiritual potential for the glory of God. That's the greatest honor that you could show toward your parents. And I wish the young men and young women who get in trouble, that they could see the heartache they bring to their mothers in particular. Uh, when these young boys get locked up, it's the mothers who ache and the mothers who agonize. It's the mothers whose hearts are broken. Now, in some rare exception, the, the fathers are there also, don't get me wrong. But most of these young men, their father is nowhere to be found. And so when you go to the courtroom, it's the mother that is there. When you go to the jail, it's the mother that is there. And these young men and young women do not realize how they're breaking the heart of their mothers in particular, aging them far, years far be beyond their time because of the worry that these mothers have for their sons and for their daughters. So if you want to honor your parents and live a godly life and seek to serve God and so that God can raise you up and you can be used by him. A little bit, a few more minutes and I'll be through. How the children imitate God at home by acts of obedience, by attitudes of honor and respect, and by, by patient acceptance of, of a present and future promise. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. He says, if you obey your parents, your actions, if you honor them with a good attitude, he says, then God gives you a promise, number one, in the presence, it's going to be well with you. It is going to be well with you. What does he mean by that? What he is saying is, it will be well with you because you will avoid some of the entanglement, some of the snares of the evil one, and you will not have to deal with, deal with that guilt and that shame and that humiliation for false choices that you will make as a young person. 
It is natural for a young person to make mistakes when they're trying to operate from their own wisdom because their experience does not give them enough background and information to make the right choices all the time. So the wisdom of the parents, and not only the wisdom of the parents, but sometimes the boundaries that the parents establish helps the child avoid certain situations where they don't have to make a choice, that they're not mature enough, that they, or that they, they don't have the fortitude enough to make and to resist temptation. He says, so if you obey your parents now, and if you honor your parents now, it will be well with you. It will be well with you. And some of the things that your peers are dealing with, some of the guilt, some of the shame, some of the humiliation, and some of the consequences that they're having to deal with, sexually transmitted diseases, out of wedlock pregnancies, guilt and shame, getting connected with people they shouldn't be associated with. You can avoid some of these things so it will be well with you. And so though the days of your youth can be days of joy and days of excitement and days of, of, of great exhilaration as you just enjoy being a young person, let me tell you something, you get to be grown fast enough and long enough. And once you are grown, you're grown forever. And so you no longer get an excuse, well, I'm just a child. You no longer get any passes. Once you become an adult, you're an adult for the rest of your earthly life, and you don't get to go back. And so you get this period of childhood to be under the authority of your parents, the guidance and the direction of your parents, and it's only for a short period of time. Don't be in a hurry to be on your own. If I could go back, I would stay at home as long as I could. But my mama wasn't allowing it. She said, you got to get up out of here. You got to go to the military. You got to go to college. You got to get a job. And you got to leave here. Now, maybe she had some intuition that she wasn't going to be around for a long time, so she couldn't develop no grown kids that was dependent upon her. And her goal was for us to be independent, self-sufficient, taking care of ourselves, and so she prepared us to leave home. But while you were at home, you're going to do what I say do, when I say do it, for as long as I say do it. That's just the way it is. If you don't like it, she would say, I'll break your plate. And everybody understood what that meant. If your plate was broken, that means that you were not invited to the dinner table. And don't go in the refrigeration on your own. Because the refrigerator belongs to her, and everything in the refrigerator belongs to her. And so once your plate is broken, you are no longer entitled to a meal in her house. Children, obey your parents. It's right. Honor your father and mother. It's the first commandment. You've got to promise now it'll be well with you and a promise later that your life will be long upon the earth. Now what does that mean? What it means is every day that God appointed for you to have, you will have. And that you will live to the age that God will have for you to live and it will be a good life, a productive life, a fruitful life, and your life will not be sh cut short. Some young people's lives are being cut short. It's not God's will that these young people die at 19. It's not God's will that they die at 24 and 25. That's not God's will. But be because they are choosing a lifestyle that puts them in harm's way, then God does not protect them from the consequences of a premature death. It will be well with you now, and you will be here as long as you're supposed to be here doing what God wanted you to do. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for it's right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. I share with you often as I close, I'm going to share with you right now again. The only hope for our culture is for us to raise up a godly seed of young folk that know the Lord and that love the Lord and who are committed to serving God and who become a biblical alternative in this cesspool of a society that we call a world, that become God's choice servants, God's men and women, who God will use as instruments of righteousness, and that God will use as tools of evangelism and outreach to reach their peers and to influence their peers with the gospel of the grace of God. But young people got to be willing to accept 
that they need to be nurtured and to be ministered to and to be disciplined and developed by their parents so that they can be prepared to do all that God has for them to do. God prepares you for the future during your childhood years when you are being nurtured and discipled and, and people are pouring into your life and so that in years to come you are pulled out of that reservoir of wisdom and knowledge and information that has been deposited inside of you. But you've got to listen to your parents. It's the right thing to do. And God will bless you. And God will extend your days on the earth. If you want to honor your mothers, then obey them. If you really love your mother, then obey her. If she say, come home at 10 o'clock, don't come there at 1030. 10 o'clock is 10 o'clock. It's 10 o'clock. Why is it that we can count money? Somebody say $10, we give, they give us nine. We, oh, no, I want $10. We can count money, but we can't count on the clock. Oh, I, didn't, I wasn't paying attention. Oh, I thought that was, uh, I didn't realize that that was already 1030. Now, when we learn how to obey in the little things, they transfer to making bigger decisions. And when we prove that we are faithful to obey in the little thing, then to give the parents the confidence. Now, who in the world? Now, think about this. You can't distinguish between 10 o'clock and 1030. Yet, you want to drive the car. So, it is reasonable for the parents to deduce if they can't tell the difference between 10 o'clock and 10.30, they can't tell the difference between 30 miles per hour and, and 90 miles per hour. So I can't trust them with the automobile because I can't trust them to read the clock. Children, obey your parents and the Lord because it's right. It's the right thing to do. And put yourself in a position where God can bless you. I shared with the, the Bible study on Wednesday night a simple but a profound point. That when God is your problem, you got a problem. And sometimes children think that their parents are their problem and their parent really isn't their problem. Sometimes husbands think the wife is their problem, but that isn't the problem. The wife thinks the husband's a problem, but that ain't the problem. The problem is God. And when God is your problem, the only answer is obedience. Because he can't be manipulated. He can't be deceived. He can't be not connived with or hoodwinked. There are times when children don't understand that their problem is not that their parents are too stern or too hard. The problem is that God is dealing with them with this whole attitude of disrespect toward their parents and this whole, these actions of disobedience. And so a lot of the frustration that they're experiencing and feeling is that God is dealing with them. Now why, would, why do we think that God would deal with children in the Bible but not deal with children today? If God dealt with children in the Bible, God is still dealing with children today about obeying him by first learning to obey their parents. Children, obey your parents because it's right. Honor your mother and father that your days upon the earth might be long and they might be well with you. And don't wait till they land down in the castle to come crying crocodile tears and then want to get over in the castle and all that type of business. They're not even in there then. And so you crying all over them and snot running all down your mouth over in the casket, and your mama is not even in there. And when you had a chance, you could honor her with your actions of obedience, with an attitude of honor and respect, and a commitment to being all that God wanted you to be. Well, I'm not through, but I'm out of time. So i got to stop right here. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you. We thank you.